and a few other things like that. Um, so he's very grateful. And it's coming out in re on review. Thank you, I sent you the information about that. Um, I was in touch, or rather I had one of these conference things with HQ, Positive Money HQ. That's, there's about 30 groups now and others being set up and they, they try and find out what they're doing and they suggest what, what we might do. The only thing that was slightly interesting was that they want to interview particularly women and younger people what they think about money in the financial system. They're also doing some sort of research to try and base their, I think their marketing approach so if you're interested in doing that, could you please go to the website and you can link in there. there is a, it's, they call it Resonator or something. Anyway, if you're interested in doing that sort of thing, you're good at it, at interviewing people, then please, they'd be very grateful. Um, next month, um, we've got Neil Smith coming, Plymouth. He's a lecturer in economics at Plymouth, and he's given us what, two talks, I think, hasn't he? One each year, I think. And he's doing his PhD in the sort of, this sort of area anyway. So, uh, and he always gives a very interesting talk, so uh, I hope you'll like that. Uh, and that's all we've got lined up. I'm not sure what we're doing in December onwards, but I'll let you know next time. And if you've got any Brilliant idea. What, what date in November is that? What? Talk. What date? Yeah, what date? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it's the Thursday. It's probably the last Thursday in November. But I'll let you know. I'll have to look it up on my. Unless someone knows. I'll find the last Thursday. But well, I have sent you around the, the, the diary 30th? of events. 30th of November. Is it? Yeah. But it, I think, I think if you're after a Thursday, no, it's a Thursday. Yeah, well, I think it's the one before that. Anyway, I'll let you know. I'll let you know. Um, Tony Greenham, who's trying to set up this community bank in the southwest, who gave us came and talked to us about three three months ago, is giving a talk tomorrow, I think. Here, anyone know? Who, who knows? Yeah, definitely here. Definitely here. Well, whether it's this room, I don't know. It's this but it's here. actually here, and it's at seven o'clock. At seven yeah. o'clock. So if you missed what his talk, I'm sure it'll be the same. You know, it might be a little bit advanced. I hope it is. I hope he's done it further on the since he last talked. Uh, uh, then it would really is, he, he gives a very good talk about why we need a community bank, the sort we should have, and why he, should he be the president of it, or whatever it is. <laughs> So that's, that's him tomorrow night, night here. Right, well, Richard, uh, thank you very much for offering to talk uh, this evening. The talk is Money and Power, Power and Money. From ancient Greece to the present day. From yeah. ancient Greece to the present yeah, thank day. You. Thank you. Great, thank you. Let's, I'll turn out the lights. Thanks very much for inviting me. Thanks for coming. I've been <coughs> paid to think about the past for about 40 years at the taxpayer's expense, <laughs> at your expense, and so this is a tiny token of gratitude. Um, now, the past is politically important for a number of reasons. One is that when we think about the institutions that we have, it's clear we don't have them because they're be the best possible institutions. They may work, they may not work, but they're always a result of processes from the past, sometimes centuries old. And the Bank of England, that I'll come on to, is an example of that. Another lesson that you learn from studying the past is this, that, as I sometimes put it, culture is always represented as nature. Now, all that means is that when human beings create institutions, social processes, they almost always imagine they're not just made by human beings, but they're part of nature. And to give you an obvious example, the ancient Greeks believed that there was a god, Zeus, who had a beard and sat on a throne. Now, that is a, 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 patriarchal, a patriarchal monarch. 
and, and Zeus supports patriarchal monarchs on this earth. Um, and of course, what's happening there is that the institution of patriarchal monarchy, which is made purely made by human beings, is inscribed in the universe. It's made part of nature. That is how it exercises its power. And you could say the same thing about nowadays about the laws of economics. The laws of economics are sometimes represented as if they're like the laws of physics. They're about the nature of the world. And that's ideologically very powerful. But they're not like that at all. They exist as conditional laws, that is to say, if X, then Y will happen. If people spend so much money, then there will be the following consequences. But that's laws in a very, very minor sense. They're not laws like the laws of physics. But they're often represented as that, so people find it very puzzling that these very elaborate mathematical models of the economy were not able even to predict the great crisis of 2007 to 2008, at which point academic economics seemed to be completely useless, at least at predicting crises. And the reason for that is, of course, they're not laws in the sense that you have laws of physics and laws of chemistry. But my point is that they're represented as laws, and that is ideology in the same way that representing a patriarchal monarch as ruling up in the sky is ideology. It's ideology in the same way. It seems to me that the idea of Zeus isn't more absurd than neoclassical neo economic theory. I mean, it, both of them are equally absurd, it seems to me. And they're, both, they're similar in the sense that they're both ideological constructions serving a particular interest. And another thing that you learn from studying the past is that no institution lasts forever. No institution has ever just lost it forever in the sense that, well, I don't mean in the trivial sense that we, we've still got a lot of time to go, but every great institution, every great civilization, Greece, Rome, Babylon, uh, the absolute monarchy in England, they've all come to an end against a great deal of resistance. But nevertheless, every society thinks, oh, well, we've got it right. We've got the right institutions. There's no need to change them. And they're always wrong because eventually either there's a complete catastrophe and they change in that way, or people decide to change them before there's a catastrophe. So that's a very important lesson that you learn from studying the past. And um, I want to talk, firstly, briefly about what money is. And this will be familiar. In fact, much of what I say will be familiar to at least some of you. The point is to provoke some kind of discussion. And I then want to talk about what I call the illusions of money. And then describe what I call two great transformations, two great historical transformations, both of which involve money. And although they're only about money, in my view, they're the two, perhaps the two most historical, the two greatest historical transformations that we've ever had. Um, so that's the structure of what I'm going to say. And when you try to imagine what money is, and of course, money is very mysterious. It's central to all our lives, but it's still mysterious, and economists can't really agree on a definition. Um, it's a good idea to imagine everything going on in the same way, but without any money. So you go into a shop, and the shopkeeper gives you a hat. You don't pay the money, you just go out. Just imagine it all without money. And then you, it's easy to see what the role of money is. Because what money is not is a thing, in the way that rice or wood or coal is a thing. We have to imagine that it's a thing, just in order to conduct our lives. But actually, it's not a thing. And that means you can make it out of nothing. And that's to say, when Amber Rudd said there's no magic money tree, she was precisely, precisely wrong. <laughs> it couldn't have been more wrong. Politicians, like everybody else, lives in, live in bubbles. It's convenient to say that there is no magic money tree. Absolutely wrong. It shows she has no understanding of what money is. Now, um, so money can be created out of nothing because it isn't a thing. What is it? It's a token. What is it a token of? Well, there are various answers that you can give, but here are three things, perhaps I think the three most important things that money is a token of. You go into a shop and buy a hat, and you give the shopkeeper four coins. What you've done is to exercise the power, power over the shopkeeper by 
giving him the coins, you've made him give you the hat. And indirectly, you've exercised power over the people who made the hat. So money is power. If you have money, you have power, which you exercise over other people. So money is power. With money, you get people to do things for you, directly or indirectly. That's very important. And power is not a, a thing, it's a relation. You don't just have power. You have power over other people. And there are other kinds of power, but I'm talking about interpersonal power. Money is also a certain kind of power, uh, not any old power. It's, it's, um, it's the power of debt, the power that inheres in debt. Because by virtue of having your four pound coins, you are owed something. You are owed something of the value of those four pound coins. That's why you get it. So it's not the sort of power that enables you to go in and kill somebody. It's the power that extracts things from other people, meaning that in some sense it's owed to you. Now it's not owed to you by that particular shopkeeper. It's owed to you in a general way. That's why I call money generalised power and generalised debt. And debt, too, is a relation, not a thing. Um, it's also, of course, transferable, because the four pounds can then be used by the shopkeeper to buy something else. So, for me, almost the best definition of money is that it's generalised, transferable power in the form of debt. And this may seem a bit odd, because you think, oh, well, I mean, money's money. I mean, heaven's sake, we all know what it is. It's, it's what you've got in your pocket. So why do we need anything more than that? Well, we do need something more than that because money is used to mystify people. And it's a good idea, it's personally liberating to know what money is. And if enough people understand what money is, it then becomes politically liberating. And these processes of handing over the four coins and getting the hat and the transferability and the generalizability of money all depend on confidence, of course, because it's a token. The token will only work because people have confidence in it. So confidence, too, is an essential ingredient of money. Now, there are other definitions of money, but that, I think, for us, is the most useful definition of money. And above all, it shows you that money is not a thing. It's a relation. Uh, which is embodied in a token, and the government, and indeed other people, can create as many tokens as they like, virtually out of nothing. There absolutely is a magic money tree. There are many magic money trees. doesn't mean you government should flood everything with currency, but they could if they wanted to. Now, um, that will be familiar to all of you, or some of you, um, and let me get this right. I now want to go into a more historical mode to explain how we got from the distant past to where we are now, and uh, think about power in a pre-monetary society. If you don't have the money, which of course is a great embodiment of power, how is social power exercised in society? How do people exercise power? over each other. And basically, in a pre-monetary society, there are two kinds of power. There's physical force, either the reality of it or the threat of violence, um, and there's persuasion. And persuasion comes in basically two forms, because, see, religion is a, sort of a combination of A and B. Um, morality and ideology. And morality is quite simply appealing to people's sense of justice saying, I've given you this, you should give me something else in return. We all know what morality is, and we still have it in public life, just about. Uh, certainly have it in private life. And then there's ideology. And ideology and morality tend to overlap or to interpenetrate. So, um, but uh, the difference between them is that ideology is where the imperative represents the interests of one group of people over another group of people. 
Simply to have equal exchange doesn't do that. It just seems obviously just that there should be some sort of reciprocity in exchange. But if you start paying debts to the king, the ideology is you must pay your debts to the king. That, of course, represents the interests of one section of society over another. And by the way, if you pay your debt to the king, that may be represented as a kind of morality, but more likely it's just a fact. The fact of the matter is that there is a debt that you have to pay to the king. That's ideology, and that, of course, is doing what I referred to earlier, transforming a human construction, a human institution, into a natural fact. The fact is that you have a debt to the king, and so you pay it. Fact about the world. It isn't, of course, it's a human construction. But it's represented as a fact, and that's what ideology does. And in pre-monetary ideology, debt is enormously important. It's almost how these pre-monetary societies, certainly large-scale pre-monetary societies, work. And then there's religion. And religion operates as a, a transcendent force, a, a, a force, or a reality at least, it is imagined is outside the world and operates on the world to reinforce many things, but certainly to reinforce morality in a sense of justice, and indeed to reinforce ideology so that you might say, well, you pay your debt to the king because Zeus is a god who insists that you pay your debt to the king. So religion can reinforce ideology as well as morality. And that's pretty much how pre-monetary societies work. Now, um, what this means is uh, before I go on to the more historical part, talking a little bit about ancient Greece, is that there are a lot of illusions about money. There are numerous illusions about money. But here are what I call the three great illusions. One is that money is a thing. I've said enough about that. It's obviously it's not a thing. And secondly, that debt can be eliminated because in a broad sense of debt, if you have money, that is debt. It's a debt to you. The debt to you is implied by the fact that you have money. It's a generalised debt, it's a transferable debt, it's not a debt from a specific person to you, but it's still a debt, a generalised, transferable debt. So debt cannot be eliminated. If you were to eliminate all the debt in our economy, you wouldn't have any money. We'll come back to that point later on. And illusions one and illusions two add up to make what is perhaps the most devastating illusion that we have, and, and, and monetary societies actually have almost always had, which is the illusion of economic self-sufficiency, which underpins creeds like libertarianism. And it's very simple. I have a lot of money, and therefore I'm autonomous, I'm self-sufficient, I don't need anybody. Um, and of course, if money is a relation, that libertarian idea is a complete illusion because it's money on which you live. It isn't a thing like a great pile of corn. No, you have a, by virtue of having a lot of money, what you have is power over other people. And therefore you depend on them accepting the validity of the currency, accepting the arrangement by which you have power over them. So in a monetary society, there's no such thing as economic, individual self-sufficiency. It's illusion. It always has been. It was in the ancient Greek world. It is now. People in a monetary society are always dependent on each other. Now, there are actually exceptions to that, but they're not the exceptions which libertarians think about. For example, if you lived in a cave and you had a small holding and you like Robinson Crusoe phenomenon, you don't depend on anybody else at all. You have your own small holding. You grow everything you need. You have no monetary or economic relationship with anybody else. You have no money. And then, indeed, you are like a hermit, and you are <coughs> indeed self -sufficient. That's the only way you can be self-sufficient in a monetized society. But what the libertarians imagine is that sort of everybody in a monetized society can be individually autonomous. And that, of course, is, is an illusion. Now, uh, but it comes in other guises as well. I mean, it's, it's just part of the fabric of our life. It's one of the great illusions that we live by. Now, um, I want to 
go on to the one area which I do have expertise in, whereas I'm talking often of things I don't have a great deal of expertise in. Now, I managed, I think, to grasp the basic structure of things. This is an area which I've written quite a lot about, and it's the invention of coinage in Greece about 600 BC, which produces the first thoroughly monetized society in history. By that, I mean a society in which people go, go to market with coins to buy fish, and money is everywhere. There's a store of value, a measure of value, a means of payment, a means of exchange, just like we have now, but which the ancient Egyptians, for example, didn't have. So the Greeks are the first people to have lots of coins, they invented coinage, and they have a thoroughly monetized society. And one of the things I've argued in my publications is that this is one reason why the Greeks actually seem pretty familiar to us. You go to ancient Egypt, you see all that art, you know, you know, read some of their texts, and it's another world. I mean, it's fascinating, but it's a completely different world. You start reading Homer, Greek philosophy, look at their art, and say, oh yes, this is where it all begins. This is where our civilization begins. A lot of people would agree with that. The question is, how did that happen? Why did it happen? And the argument of my book is that it, a very important factor is the fact that they are the first people to use money. So all those pre-monetary arrangements of power become far less important. Money takes over much of the function of our ideology, uh, in particular physical violence and so on. I'll come on to that. So about 600 BC, you're all starting to get coins. And like, there's a nice example of some Athenian, an Athenian coin the front and the back, as it were. And I want to make two points only about Greek coins. One is that the conventional value of a coin is created by the imprint, which is put on it by the polis, by the state. Its intrinsic value, how much silver it has and how pure the silver is, is also important. But the intrinsic value is always less than the conventional value. So this is a mysterious thing. It's, got, it's made of metal, and yet its value isn't decided by its metal content. Its value is greater than that. It's decided by the mark on it, which establishes its conventional value, the value which you can use it for. And so the principle that we have of paper money is already inherent in the very first Greek coinage. Nothing like that had ever occurred in the history of the world. For a Babylonian, a piece of metal is a piece of metal, it's not a symbol, it's not a token. The Greeks are the first people to use the principle that something can be, in a sense, different in value from its actual inherent value. That is an enormously important principle. But what the Greeks don't do is to say, well, the inherent value doesn't matter at all. They never invent paper money. You don't go so far as to say, let's just have the token. It doesn't matter about the content at all, as we do with paper money or electronic money. What, it's what I call a dual system of confidence. You need two things. You need um, metal, which is recognizably silver and reasonably pure, and you also need the stamp. And you need both of those things, which will function as coined money. Now, actually, there are times when states run out of silver, and they, they then issue bronze coins and say, okay, guys, uh, this is a bronze coin, but treat it as if it was silver. It's going to be worth the same amount as a silver coin, even though it's bronze. And it, it worked. I mean, the Athenians did that for a time. And it did work for a few years, but people really didn't like it. It created great anxiety. They got the principle. They could implement it because they weren't stupid Egyptians or Babylonians. <laughs> but they didn't like it, and it never took off. It would have been very convenient for the states to say, well, uh, sod it, let's just forget silver altogether and use base metal and our token money. We never did that. The result is often they then debased their coinage by reducing the amount of silver and so on, and, and particularly in the Roman Empire, that created all sorts of problems. But they, they never resorted to paper money. Of course, you can never stop people issuing IOUs. And to a small extent, IOUs were used in the ancient world as something like money in the sense that you could, rather than handing over a load of gold and silver when you bought a horse, you might say, oh, well, I've got some gold and silver deposited with this chap. 
and he's giving you an IOU, why don't you just give you the IOU? I mean, that's how paper money originates. And a little bit, a very little bit of that went on in ancient world, but basically not very much. Um, notice also about this, there's a god of goddess there. You've got a goddess Athena on the coin, and notice she's wearing a helmet, I'll come back to that. Uh, meaning, somebody everybody recognises. This is where confidence is expressed. You have a symbol that all the citizens recognise, and it's a deity. And a deity is rather like money in the sense that Athena doesn't exist, but everybody imagines that she exists, and everybody accepts that she exists, and similarly the value of money doesn't really, conventional value doesn't really exist. I mean, it's a fiction, but it doesn't matter because everybody believes it. So deity and money are similar in the sense you could say they're both fictions which are useful because everybody believes them. All right. And they coordinate activity. I'll come back to that point. <coughs> um, now, <coughs> as a result of this invention of money in the form of coinage in the 6th century BC, as I said, huge cultural changes take place. And we have texts from the 6th, 5th, 4th century which show that money is, as it is now, regarded as disruptive, as all-powerful, as destructive of all sorts of things, of friendship, of love, of families, of honour, of all the old virtues. And so there are all these texts. The Greeks are, in a sense, horrified by money, and it's unlimited. I mean, there's a wonderful text in Aristophanes which two people are talking about money and saying, one of them says, funny thing about money, if you, if you have pea soup, after a time you've had enough of it, and it's the same with honour or sex or, or all sorts of things, generally everything in the world you can have enough of, but except money, you can't <laughs> have enough money. And if you've got 16 talents, which is a lot of money, you think, I, I really need 25, and if you've got 25, you say, I die if I don't have 40 and so on. So, they were very aware of the unique properties of money. So Greek texts are full of this stuff about money. And, um, of course, what's happening is represented here in the sense that the power in monetary society, which I showed in the earlier slide, has had something added to it, which is money. Power in monetary society is, is, remains the same as it is in pre-monetary society, which is this, as you remember, except that these things, the persuasion, morality, ideology, and religion, are threatened by, marginalised by, and gradually replaced by money. And you might say that this process has gone on since then up to the present day, in which money is by far the most powerful thing in our society. It marginalises morality, ideology, and religion. Because money is the impersonalization and generalization of debt, which is absolutely central to ideology. But in ideology, in the old pre-monetary system, when you have debt, you have it to a person or a series of people. You have it to priests, you have it to the king or whoever it is. Uh, it's, it's specific debt or interpersonal debt. What money does is to take debt and make it impersonal, it's embedded in the, the, the coin, and generalise. So it's not debt to any particular person. But as, as I was explaining earlier, a kind of general debt. And this is, of course, enormously convenient. And I should say, it is, in a sense, quite liberating. And there's one reason why the Greeks seem more like us, not the only reason. Because if you've got money in your pocket, you've got, you've got power in your pocket. Your, your Egyptian slave or your Egyptian worker is simply owes a debt to the pharaoh, is obliged to work to build the pyramids, has no choice in the matter. Once you've got your Athenian peasant and you've got money in your pocket, then you have much more freedom. So money has this great liberating quality when it is first invented. But of course it has the other problem that it can be accumulated in an unlimited way by certain individuals who can then use it to exercise power over everybody else. So the arrival of money changes this whole configuration. That remains um, as extremely important physical force, 
but, um, and incidentally, debt is often created by physical force, by people conquering other people, um, and held in place by physical force. I mean, ideology and a bit of morality may, might get people to pay their debts, but if they don't pay their debts, you've got to use physical force. Uh, and what money does is to join physical force as the, one of the two great powers in society from Greek society onwards. Relegating these, um, these uh, factors, which then are thrown into a kind of crisis. And part of what I publish is saying that these intellectual transformations that you find in a period of about 700 BC to 200 BC in Greece, in India, in China, the intellectual transformations which are quite similar in these three cultures and to some extent in Israel and make us what we are. This is the great intellectual revolution which we have inherited. To a large extent, they are reactions to the enormous disruption caused by monetization and the way that it marginalizes these things, which then have to be, as it were, recreated, reconfigured, reasserted in the face of this onslaught from this impersonal agent of power, which is money. Right now, um, I've talked about the first great historical transformation. Here is the second great historical transformation, the Bank of England, created in 1694. Now, you may think, well, it's a bit parochial to talk about England. Greece is clearly important for the whole of humanity, but England is just England. Is he not just being a little bit parochial and talking about his own country? Absolutely not, because this, this of course, is an early 19th century building, but the Bank of England was created in 1694, and it transformed the British economy and British society. It was at the root of the enormous success that Britain had in creating prosperity and an empire. And it was transported to all other modern economies. So the Bank of England provided the model on which the financial system of the capitalist world still works. So it isn't just that we have Shakespeare and Darwin <laughs> and a few other things, we've also created the Bank of England, which in one sense is the most important British, or rather English, I should say, invention. Because the Scots, you see, weren't part of the UK. Well, they were, they, they were part of the UK kingdom, but they weren't part of the British state. And when they saw the extraordinary prosperity created by the Bank of England, they thought, well, we, we've got to join in for, into this. And they agreed to become part of the same state as England not long after the founding of the Bank of England. So 1694, and this... Um, is, of course, I'm going to say how it began and then its consequences for us today. Um, but first let me say that in the ancient world, as I said, money is basically metallic. There is the idea that you can have conventional value, which is separate from metallic value, but money is basically metallic, no paper money. In the course of the Middle Ages, things change, and with the potential for IOUs, to be used as money grows enormously in this international trade in the medieval period um, with centres particularly in the Low Countries and in Italy. England is a rather a backwater in this respect, but you have banking families. But basically the, the principle is very simple, it's the IOU. You leave your metal with me or some valuable object, I give you an IOU. And the IOU can say, um, I owe so-and-so, I owe Fred Bloggs six pounds of gold. I will pay Fred Bloggs six pounds of gold if he provides me with this bit of paper. If you then replace Fred Bloggs with the bearer of this bit of paper, then you've got paper money. And that, of course, can be done privately. It was done privately all the time. That is the generalizability of money coming into play by simply saying, I will pay the bearer off. Because Fred Bloggs can then take this bit of paper and use it to buy something else. Very, very simple principle of how paper money comes into being. And in the 17th century, when Bank of England was created in 1694, by that time, paper money was very, very important. Bills of exchange and 
promissory notes, or whatever they're called, it's the same principle. So you have very powerful individuals, very powerful families, politically important people, getting very rich and have this network of systems in which these bills can be cleared against each other and so on. And it's a bit mysterious to people who labour in the fields or just in doing ordinary trade, but you have this oligarchy, financial oligarchy, already in the Middle Ages. Um, they understand what money is, and most people go on thinking it's a thing. But um, you also have the sovereign, who is creating sovereign money. Same principle as in ancient Greece. The state creates the money, issues it in coinage. Now, the sovereign also has expenditure to make. And in those, but that, by the way, is the, the giving of the Royal Charter of the Bank of England in 1694. And that is the reigning sovereign at the time, William III. Now, notice that he's wearing luxurious clothes, but he's also got armour. That hybrid embodies the two ways in which the sovereign needed money. He needed it for luxury, of course, in keeping up the court, but he also needed it for military expenditure. And there was a lot of military activity in the 17th century in France, in England, and in 1672, the king, Charles II, was so much in debt, always trying to extract money through taxes and so on from his subjects, that he, he just repudiated his debts. So, okay, guys, I know I owe you a lot of money, but I haven't got any. I spent it all on the wars or whatever. I'm not going to pay you. That meant, of course, nobody would go on lending money to the king. It's rather like Donald Trump. Let me say in a footnote that part of Donald Trump's issue with the Russians is that he specialised in never paying anybody back as a property developer, so nobody would lend him money. Except there's a lot of dirty money coming in from Russia, which needed to be laundered. So <coughs> it's almost irresistible for Trump to take that money because nobody else is going to lend him any money. That's just an aside. <laughs> but the... the um, the king was, had no creditworthiness, and yet there was public expenditure, there were wars to be fought. So um, what you have then is two groups of powerful people, the crown, and the king in particular, who, who needs money for fighting wars, and you have the men of money, as they call them, who are wealthy and have credit and have financial expertise, but they do lack a certain something. They lack the universality and the reliability of sovereign money, of those coins with the king's head on them, which are universally used, which are familiar, um, and have the state to back them in the sense that they can be enforced by the power of the state as legal tender, whereas these IOUs, these bills of exchange and so on, um, they're, they're not so reliable, they're not legal tender, um, and uh, they can um, suddenly be worth nothing if people think that the issuer can't sustain them, doesn't have the wealth to sustain the paper money and so on. So you've got two groups of powerful people. The king, who has power, universality, but no credit, no money, and then you have the men of money, the Whig interest, mainly Protestant, who have a lot of money financial expertise, but um, they don't have the universality and the reliability of the king. So, of course, you create an alliance between them, a synthesis between them, and this is the creation of the Bank of England. And what happened was, it was almost the first national bank, there'd been one or two before, but they were quite minor in comparison, that a whole lot of wealthy people joined together to form a bank. And it was a, like a joint stock company, which had certain privileges from the crown. And um, there they are. And this is what the founding of this entirely new institution produces for the crown access to money. Ah, oh, that's the most important thing. All these wealthy people lend large sums of money to the crown because they, now they can do so without fear of losing it, without the fear it will just disappear into this 
bottomless pit of royal expenditure. The Crown gets competent management of its finances, because the finances are now managed by the men of money. Um, the Crown gets creditworthiness, and it can use the money to build a navy. And that's what happened. Once this Bank of England had been set up, within 12 days, they had raised £1.2 million, pounds, which in those days was a huge sum of money, because everybody realised there was 8% interest, and it was secure, because it had the state backing it, a new concept. And so they built a navy with half of this money. They built a navy. And if you build a navy, then this encourages all sorts of other trades and activities, like providing wood and guns and saltpetre and all the rest of it. So industry was enormously promoted, and employment and the creation of prosperity was enormously promoted by the building of a navy. But the building of a navy also, of course, allowed the impunity, the success of English trade all over the world. Building this navy was the beginning of the British Empire. So it was good for prosperity in that way. And the customs dues were appropriated, as it were, by the men of money, which, um, in this increasing trade, which supported the interests that they continued to acquire from this arrangement. So they got interest, they got banking privileges. It was the only joint stock bank that had limited liability. They could issue notes against bonds provided by the government. So these notes that they were issuing, rather than the old notes, which could be a bit dodgy and certainly weren't universal, um, had the security of the government behind them. So of course they were much in demand and they went everywhere. This is the beginning of the banknote, which eventually the Bank of England was the only bank allowed to issue banknotes. Initially there were other banks that could do that, but these banknotes issued by the Bank of England, which is still, a, of course, a private institution, it was private with shareholders up to 1946, but these notes were, in effect, created as private money, which is nevertheless sovereign money. That's the trick of it. And the men of money then have universality and reliability as if it's sovereign money, and they, of course, benefit enormously also from the building of the navy. This compromise, this synthesis of sovereign money and IOU money, sovereign money and private money, that is the trick which the English thought of first. And you know, this is a time of Locke and Newton and all those geniuses, and this too, in a sense, is an act of genius um, and was enormously successful. It's still important in the sense that it underpinned this extraordinary prosperity, which still, or memory of prosperity and preeminence, which still defines what it is to be English and indeed British. And it is created through this synthesis of sovereign money and private money, public interest and private interest. And there we have. There we have the logo of the Bank of England, adopted right from the beginning. Britannia, the song Rule Britannia had to wait another 46 years, <laughs> 1740. But they had Britannia right from the beginning. And that, in a sense, embodies everything I've been saying. Because this is the emblem of the bank. There are two sources in a monetary society of social power physical force and money, everything else somehow takes second um, place. What have you got? Physical power and money. This is the new world. This is the world we still live in. Of course, there's this thing too, which I take it is an olive branch showing that Britannia wants peace but is prepared to jab her um, spear into you if you don't accept the terms of the peace. And so, again, the emblem of the British Empire, so the symbolism, but basically those are the resources. Those are the things, those two things control the world and created the British Empire and prosperity. So that's physical force and money. I said it in words, but you couldn't get a better visual representation of it than the logo of the Bank of England. And indeed, it takes one back to another 
woman wearing a helmet, Athena, um, who is actually on the coin. Um, and um, so there's a tradition of the woman on the helmet, the, the goddess wearing a helmet being on a coin. I don't think it's a copy, it's just say it's similar conditions but using a similar idea. That's a Roman coin from Britain and you can, re you can read Britannia on it and you can see her shield, you may not be able to see her, her, her spear, um, but that's in the tradition of the coin with Athena with a helmet on it. It is a national emblem which has confidence but also power, military power on the coin. It's again a combination of physical force and the confidence in the coin, uh, like our beloved Britannia. Um, and I, I end then with a footnote to my description of this synthesis, because I said at the beginning of the talk, no institution mm -hmm. lasts forever. Vested interests <coughs> keep it going, even when it clearly need serious reform. The Bank of England has had been reformed very considerably over its history. It, more and more it started regulating bank, banking. It became a lender of last resort to ensure that other banks were provided with liquidity if they needed it, and so on and so on. Um, and many other reforms. But this stuff is very striking when I looked at this. What you have in 1694 is um, an arrangement which deploys private money, the banker's money, for the public interest, the Navy. The British Empire depended on this public expenditure. Private enterprise always depends on public expenditure. There's a myth that there's something, as it were, anti-wealth creation about public expenditure. Nothing could be further from the truth. What you have in the crisis of 2008 is the precise opposite. Public taxpayers' money is deployed for the private banker's interest. Now let me say, um, although the Bank of England provided liquidity for Northern Rock in 2007, when it came to provide credit support, which is quite different from liquidity, in 2008, it wasn't the Bank of England that provided, it was the Treasury. But that's a pretty minor distinction. It's a state financial institution which is being used to provide your money, public money, for private bankers' interests. And of course, they would say, well, it wasn't just the private bankers' interests. We had to do this to prevent the whole system collapsing, which would have been harmful to everybody. But basically, the private interest was sustained, um, had to be sustained, because of the way our financial system is set up. So, as I was saying, no institution lasts forever. The institution of the Bank of England has lasted all this time because it has been, in a sense, phenomenally successful. It was the secret to the British prosperity and the British Empire. That empire has gone. That prosperity looks as if it's on the way out. And yet, people remain attached through vested interests and a sense of tradition to institutions which are no longer fit for purpose. And it's not just that it's turned into its opposite in this respect. It's also that the public expenditure, which was deployed from private funds in 1694, was monarchical. I mean, in a sense, it, was it public or was it just one person? Well, if you create a navy, it's the crown that's doing it. But in a sense, it's public expenditure. Um, I mean, the crown now, of course, is uh, concerned with public expenditure. So. Um, Public expenditure there was monarchical, but now public expenditure is, or is meant to be, democratic. And despite that improvement, nevertheless, the bank's function has turned into its opposite. Um, and that's where positive money comes in. And I think I've come to an end. So thank you for listening. Thank you very much for that. That was really quite enlightening. I do have one sort of 
semantic quibble with one, af one aspect of it, nothing sort of substantive. Um, it's to do with the use, sort of use of the term debt, really, because, as you say, sort of money, money is a token. Um, it's sort of units of money and units of account, and the, the accounting system is sort of in the context of sort of intermeshed mutual obligation, has to be. <coughs> Um, but if you, if you regard that sort of reciprocal, generalised reciprocal obligation as debt, if you use the word debt for it, it doesn't seem to me to make a distinction between sort of with, from debt as a kind of a net, a net debit, a net sort of having, a, having an account which is sort of net in the minus. So you could say, you could have a, in, in principle, you could have a... A, money, a, money, a sort of a money system, a system of mutual obligation where everybody say, which was complete, complete sort of had completely equal outcomes in terms of sort of money deposits. Every, everyone had say 20,000 units of money, and they they exchange, they sort of use these as units of account, and they sort of there's obligation to kind of to honour the to honour the token, because that's how the system works. And, and but that's quite different to say it's the system we have now, whereas some people have many billions. And quite an, an awful lot of people, one way or another, if you take all their all their sort of aspects of the accounting, are have actually got a, a minus balance. And I would I would have said, sort of so if you if you actually sort of talk about either sort of all all of those possibilities under the term debt, I think you're fail, you're failing to failing to make a very important semantic distinction. Yes, I mean you're quite right, and. Um, the way I would deal with it at one level would, I don't know whether this would satisfy you, would be to distinguish between generalised debt and specific debt. So let's suppose you gave everybody in the country £20,000 through helicopter money, and that's all yeah. the money they had. Then, um, of course, what you'd be doing would be putting the state in debt to all its citizens equally, in a sense. Right? But the state wouldn't really be in debt for well-known reasons, because yes. how are people going to reclaim these debts? What the state would be doing would be saying, here's this, this debt which you can use, this generalised debt which you can use to acquire what you want. But it is a relation, it is a, but a generalised relation. When people get into personal debt to banks and all the rest of it, or to other people, then it's, it's specific debt. Or, or interpersonal debt rather than generalised debt. That would be, at a theoretical level, that's, I think that's the, how I would deal with your point. However, I think that you're, nevertheless, I, it, it's unlikely to satisfy you or even me because there's a political issue here. Yeah. And we do want to distinguish, we do want to be able to say we, we, we can no longer go on with these levels of debt, what I would call specific debt. Mm -hmm. um, if somebody comes along and says, well, that's pie in the sky because money is debt, you can't get rid of debt. My response would be, well, of course you can get rid of specific debt. That's the problem, while recognising also that at a theoretical level, all money is debt and sure, well, you can't get rid of it. Te technically, yeah, fine. Yeah, I mean, you, you, can sort of, you can make a very coherent case, as you've just done. But I, I, think, I think the kind of the, in, the, the impact the impact that is lost if you if you if you rely on those very sort of very subtle distinctions. Yes. I mean, yes. I was a few years ago. I was arguing in a pub with somebody who had been an I an, sort of an IMF or whatnot, a World Bank economist, and sort of I was sort of ear bashing her about the positive money, and she said she just sort of apart from being affronted as someone who wasn't a professional, yes. was going to tell her what money was or how it worked. She was like, well, actually, sort of you know. All sort of all money is debt, so I don't have a problem with debt. You shouldn't have a problem with debt either. Yeah, and yeah. so I think if you if you sort of if you if you t take your the technical line that your presentation did, I think it's sort of it's much harder to get to sort of to make points with somebody like that or any, well, anybody. Well, yes, I mean I'm not sure it depends depends how willing they are to listen, because what, <laughs> as you said, I mean, at the theoretical level, I don't think what I've said in a sense it's obvious that what I've said is true. Yeah. Your objection to it is not that it's not true, yeah. but that it can confuse the issue. And if you are, to, which it can, you're absolutely right. But if your World Bank economist was prepared to think deeply about it, they would have understood the distinction between generalised debt and specific debt. I just invent, I mean, I invented that distinction, that's whether it exists. I invented it while uh, thinking about what to say this evening. But I think I'd want to stay with that distinction between specific debt and generalised debt. 
Okay, I, I think I would, prefer, I would prefer I would prefer a sort of a, a terminology of gen, generalized mutual obligation as distinct from yes, debt. Okay. Which I, okay, I don't object to that. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I was fascinated about that partnership between Crown and uh, and Bank. I think mean, that's fascinating. And <coughs> you could argue that has the Crown been replaced with Parliament, and Parliament and the banks are now in <laughs> coats. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know what your thoughts on that are. Um, well, the, the Crown is in effect supposed to be controlled in financial terms, ultimately by Parliament. I suppose. In de facto, anyway, um, and but but I mean the, the broader issue is is that I mean the banks have the power. Banks are clearly over Parliament. It's not so much Parliament's in cahoots with the banks, but Parliament is su subordinate to the banks. Um, we think Parliament has power, but no, clearly it's the banks that have power. And uh, well, well, they, we allow them to have the power. We do, yes. But the point about the synthesis of 1694, as I call it, the synthesis, is this synthesis of sovereign money and private money, that which, it, which nobody had thought of before. Because there was sovereign money, which was coins, with the king's head on it, and then there was private money, which were these IOUs, or bills of exchange. And they operated in different spheres. They were just different. Um, and in the Bank of England, they came together. Because you then had notes administered by the bankers, the men of money, but with the backing of the sovereign. They may have initially even had the sovereign's head on them, I don't know. Well, they only do now. And it's that synthesis which, in a sense, is the problem because banks can issue private sovereign issue privately issued sovereign money. If you just had sovereign money, which is what positive money is proposing, you'd go back to a, a situation like well, like the ancient Greek world yes. actually, in which there's only one kind of money. But that's what most people think happens anyway, because positive money, what it's proposing is incredibly conservative and unexciting and um, well, uh, minimal, because that's what everybody thinks happens anyway. People think money is created by the state. I, I cannot think of a less revolutionary, <laughs> a, less di a, a, less, a less disturbing proposal than to propose that we introduce a state of affairs which everybody thinks already exists. <laughs> and surely, in that case, everybody wrong. I mean, the banks are private, or, you know, <laughs> private organisations yeah. who, who make money out of all of this by trolling the supply of debt or whatever yes. you call it. Yes, and that, that starts with the Bank, with bank, with bank of England, mm. is my point. And, but it started because of a particular historical crisis, because the king didn't have enough money mm. to build a navy. And it worked extremely well, which is why we still have it, however preposterous it is. You have this preposterous arrangement because it's been so successful initially and then for a long period afterwards. And now those conditions have gone and yet we still have it. Classic case from a historian's point of view of the inability of a society to reform itself, to avoid decline. Going back to Greece, they were very worried that, uh, that, that money was going to cause all the problems with idol uh, 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 the, the religion and so forth. Did they do anything about it to try and stop it? Um, I mean, and which we could learn from. Ah, uh, well, <laughs> because they don't have private money, or hardly any, they, they, the problems that they have are very different. I mean, the fact that, but what they, I mean, take ancient Athens, it was supposed to be when democracy was created. One of the things that you have is, is basically you have a citizen income. That is to say, there's a lot of, and they did have metal, and one reason why Athens was so prosperous and so culturally important was that they were virtually the only city state that had their own source of silver and silver money, so they could produce a great deal of it. 
and they tended to use it. They, they actually built a navy with it, like the British. Um, but they, that's why they became so powerful. But they also did things like put on these wonderful plays, which I've spent half my life studying, and um, distributed among the citizens. Which, of course, we think is something very odd. But, of course, that's how most pre-modern societies work, is through what we call citizens' income. The idea that you don't have a citizen's income is a newfangled capitalist notion or feudal notion. I mean, in the ancient world of traditional societies, of course everybody has a right to a share in the wealth of the community. Uh, and certainly the Athenians distributed money to citizens, bits of silver, coins to citizens. Um, and that makes them very different in ethos. But the danger that arises is when one person gets too much of this stuff because it is so powerful, and the tyrant who's a figure of tragedy and well-known from historical writers, is the autocrat who, who rules, not in the traditional way, like the kings of mythology in the Iliad, by the grace of God or whatever, but simply by having loads of money. And you have, for the first time, um, I was going to say the Donald Trump figure, but if, you know, if it must, that doesn't work, that analogy. But you have these very wealthy individuals who rule the society through their accumulation of money, and the Greeks are very conscious of that, and they do take steps. The Athenians, uh, uh, the Athenian democrats are almost obsessive with, with preventing tyranny, and one of the things that they do, which in a sense does answer your question, is that they would get the wealthiest citizens to fund public expenditure, like dramatic festivals or building the fleet. So they'd say, well, you're the wealthiest, per you're the wealthiest person in Athens, you must build three triremes. So you had to do it. Um, and if you said, no, no, the, he's wealthier than me, this is, a, this is actually an Athenian institution, fascinating, I think we should adopt it ourselves. If you say, no, he's wealthier than me, then something called the antithesis kicks in. So, okay, um, if, he's wealthier than, if he's wealthier than you, swap properties. <laughs> So, if he wasn't wealthier, then, yeah. so, um, that was the way that they extracted money from the very wealthy for public expenditure. Uh, and that's something. <laughs> so, I mean, the point is, Athenian society is infinitely more egalitarian than what we have. And they, I mean, people like Aristotle, if they came um, to look at our society today, if so this is a democracy, they would laugh. It is preposterous. How can you have a democracy when you've got so much inequality? It's a joke. Um, Athenian democracy is based on some level of economic equality. What's the difference between a citizen's income and a universal basic income? Well, I use a citizen's income um, simply for the case of Athens. And I'm not using it very precisely. All I'm saying is that by virtue of being a citizen, you have the right to certain sources of income. So instead of council tax, it was like the opposite. Instead of paying towards sustaining the community, well, you it, get it, funds it, it, from... It's individuals. It's not a property thing. It's, you don't have to have property yeah. to get it or pay a tax. By virtue of being a citizen, you have the right... You had to write to, for example, eat meat at these great sacrifices, which is economically significant. You had the right to sit on these great juries, which exercise political power, and you were paid for that. You had a fee to help you go to the theatre. Sometimes it was just a distribution of wealth. So it's a principle that everybody has the right as a citizen, and I'm fairly only talking about male citizens here, um, to... I mean, there are clear limits on Athenian democracy. There are slaves and there are women who are outside it. But within this restricted group of people, which are male citizens, it is remarkably egalitarian and democratic. Yeah. Uh, so the universal basic income, and that's what's designed for a capitalist society, and it would be different from what the Athenians did. But the principle would be similar in the sense that everybody has a right to an income by virtue of being a citizen. Mm -hmm. Just think to myself, and that could actually involve, in fact, into a universal basic service to everybody. And people have been talking about that. And if you compare that with uh, the future of robotic societies and so on, where you've got robots doing all the work for us, could you possibly conceive of a society that doesn't actually need to have money? 
Um, well, well, you can imagine a society without money because I mean, it would be. See, a libertarian might say, "Well, that's the that's a kind of utopian vision," but nevertheless, it's important to have such a vision. A libertarian might say, "See, my argument with libertarian. This is why I do use the word debt. Is that well, no obligation will do that." If you're a true libertarian and you think everybody can achieve freedom, then you've got to get rid of money because money is debt. Money is what subordinates one person to another. Um, but in a society, the libertarian might say, which there was no money because there was no debt, um, then, of course, after all, it's clearly imaginable, and of course, all you need to do to imagine a society where there's no money, look at descriptions of societies where there isn't any money from the past. I mean, anthropologists describe societies in the 20th century in which there's no money, and Homer, Homeric epic Iliad and the Odyssey, is about a European society without money, before money came into being. And of course, what you see in those societies is that what money does in a society, which is regulate the distribution of goods and relations between people generally, <coughs> is done in other ways. <coughs> and in particular, it's done through morality and codes of practice and codes of morality, like generosity, sense of justice. Yes. And when money comes, it, by being this powerful embodiment of obligation and power, it marginalizes social morality. Mm -hmm. And it's as if morality then becomes irrelevant to public affairs with the well-known consequences that nobody really likes except the people who are benefiting financially from it. So there are plenty of societies you can study which don't have money, and what they have is instead is religion and morality. When I showed you the picture with religion, morality, and ideology somehow in small print because it was being marginalized by money. I mean, that's a very long-term process. In the 6th century BC in Athens, you have the first ever thought which imagines a world without gods, without God. It's like a modern scientific conception of a universe that just works by itself without any divine agency. That first happens in Ionia, in Miletus, Greek city, about 600 BC, exactly the same place and exactly the same time as the first monetized society in history. Why? Because you have this powerful entity, money, which is doing the work of gods. It's doing the work of everything, of morality, of ideology, of reciprocity, and so on. And the philosophy that they produced was very like money in the sense they said everything, everything you see around you consists of just one thing, which is abstract and pervades everywhere. Would you have a... Yeah, I was just wondering about, I mean, you know, knowledge and education, I mean, you know, knowledge itself is, is something which is extremely powerful. So, you know, how does that work into, you know, you buy that, you buy what, what that knowledge will give you and then that brings confidence, don't you? So it's kind of another layer. It's not, it's not about, it's not, it's sort of another layer of power, which isn't violence, and it's just like the witch doctor, isn't it? You kind of, you, you've got all that knowledge, and you, you know, it, it allows you to control technology, and, and, and yeah. where it's going, it allows you to control drugs, and, and how are they dispersed. So, I mean, I'm just wondering, I'm just trying to think how that fits in with, with, uh, you know, power and, and monetary society? Well, yes. Um, I mean, we, for example, now are engaged in a process involving knowledge and understanding in, in this group. And we hope that that will, have some, will become a player in this world which is dominated by money, that knowledge and understanding will play some part in it, in a kind of power struggle that, that goes on. So, of course, knowledge and many other things, kindness, morality, all sorts of things, play a role. But I'm talking, when I say that physical force and money are the two fundamental um, components of, of, indeed, what is fundamental about a society. Even, I mean, the Greeks would say, we're already saying, even knowledge depends on money. Because 
to get your knowledge, I mean, um, you need an education for which you may need money. And I know in, in our society, you don't necessarily need money for education, at least not school education. You now do for university education. But, but money has this way of making everything dependent on it. And in that sense, it's fundamental and, and powerful. I mean, to be sure, the things that I identified as fundamental components of social power are not the only components of social power. Knowledge can be powerful, morality can be powerful. Um, but they are, they are fund somehow fundamental, that's all. Yeah. I mean, it seems, just on, on this topic, it seems, I mean, it's, in, it's increasingly openly the case that sort of that, um, control of money will control the products of knowledge. I mean, from, yeah. from the way scientific grants are, are allocated, sort of blah, blah, blah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of knowledge, education, Richard, um, I am completely in the dark about something, and I suspect it's very fundamental and basic, haven't got it. Um, unless I misheard you, twice during your talk, um, and the second, I don't remember the context of the first time, but the second time, you were talking about the, the notional helicopter drop of £20,000. Yeah. Whatever we're going to call it, citizens, citizens' income. I believe you said, and this is where I'm missing a link, I believe you said the government would then, no, yeah, the government would then be in debt to the people to whom it had given the £20,000. And you said something similar, I think, when you were talking about the origins, maybe it was the origins of the Bank of England. I'm missing that connection, I don't understand that. Yes, I mean, um, maybe that's not right. Other, others can help me here. But when you look at your £10 note, it says, I promise to pay the bearer on demand the sum of £10. Who is promising? Okay, I'm with you. Who yeah. is promising? So the that's government the is promising. Sovereign money and that's yes. the debt. So, okay. so, you have so if they're dropping £20,000 in notes... Yeah, if you're dropping £20,000 in notes, and everyone says, I promise to pay the bearer, it's debt um, in the sense that... Uh, the, the thing is that the, the issuer of the note can cease to really matter when the note circulates yes. enough. And if the government issues the note, the sense in which the government is issuing a debt that it's acknowledging um, that it, as it were... So normally, I go back to the goldsmiths, say, of the 16th, 17th century, how paper money originates... Somebody's got some gold, they hand it over to the goldsmith to keep, because the goldsmith has got a good safe to keep it in. And the goldsmith gives him a bit of paper saying, I promise to pay you £10. And that piece of paper then, rather than being used simply to reclaim the gold, can be used by the person who gave the goldsmith the gold to buy something with. Right? Yeah. So yeah. money originates in somebody who has taken gold giving somebody a note, which then can be used as money. It originates as debt, an acknowledgement of debt. Now, in the case of the government, of course, when it says, I promise to pay the bearer the demand of ten, some £10, they don't have £10 of gold. They're not going to give you £10 no, of gold. that's I understand. It's, it's all a fiction. Aren't they just, just under, the they're underwriting the system. They, yes. they, are, yes. they are guaranteeing yes. the continuity of the system. Yeah. 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 But if, if there weren't sort of goods in the shops, then the, the ten pounds would be meaningless. Yes. In this. Yes. The difference is that they're giving it to us rather yes. than requiring that we take out a loan or we take we pay the interest on it. We That's haven't we it. haven't gone along to the Bank of England and yes. handed them over ten pounds of silver, yes. which is what did happen in the seventeenth century. Nevertheless, the note that we get from the helicopter money is in that very same tradition in which, to get it initially, you would have handed over a certain amount of silver. But right? within our current institution, it's still that part of that 97% that is debt-created. That's um, where my confusion comes in. In, our, in, well, in, our current, our current in a country monetary system, 90% of money is created by private banks issuing... Promissory notes. Yeah, I mean, cr attached, creating yeah. um, overdraft. I mean, creating or creating liabilities, right? You, you, you lend somebody money which you as a bank don't have, um, and that creates money. But then the individual is in debt. It was, it was why the banks were in debt 
that I didn't understand when you said what you said about the helicopter drop. The government. It was the government in that, in that, in that yes, case. Yes, it was the government. It was the government. Was the government. Oh, okay, yeah. right. But that, that would only that nominally be the case, wouldn't it? it totally quite certainly. I mean, just in a sense, it's misleading. Yes. But you see, if, if, everybody, if everybody suddenly gets £20,000 on my account of money, then um, people are in debt. If you've got £20,000, yes. generalisable debt is embodied in that money. There is a debt to you of twenty thousand pounds. The question then is, who owes who owes it to you? I was tempted. And originally, to originally it was the yeah. state who issued the money, but once money starts circulating, in effect, it's not the state, nor is there any particular person. It's just people in general. Yeah. And of course, that kind of debt or obligation is, is, is infinitely preferable as a way of creating money than creating it through getting particular individuals into specific interpersonal debt, which is the way we create money at the moment. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I understand that money creates power, power then creates corruption that takes, that then will push down those other things like morality and ideologies and religion and things like that that like makes them a lot smaller. If we were to have a society, obviously not with any money, because I think that would be quite a difficult step but if we were to have a site with, with a positive money sort of thing how will we get around the already corrupted society that we live in if that does that make sense yeah yeah like how do we get around that we won't we won't but upsettingly i don't think we'll be able to get back to a site that has enough moral compass to be able to live in that well that's, that's, <laughs> I mean, that's you may be right but i mean that's the issue isn't it because any society every society is engaged in some sort of internal struggle between corruption and people who want to eliminate it. And it's always a kind of stalemate, in the sense that no, no, no side wins definitively one way or the other, but they're always pushing each other this way and that way, and it could go either way. So it's not as if um, the, the corruption of the system is so pervasive that there's nothing we can do about it. Far from it. And people in this country have done an enormous amount to push back the power of finance in the interests of the well-being of the majority. Um, vast achievements in the 20th century in British society of that kind. I mean, they're always in danger of being taken away. And you might argue in the last 20 years, people have gone off their guard and, and a lot has been taken away. But then the pendulum may go the other way. It just depends on you, me, everybody here, every individual, because nobody else, you can't rely on other people to do it. I could I say yeah um, partly in what you were saying partly what you were saying I'd say that if you have more equality if you take people from above the okay line as it were they're more likely to act moral if they're struggling yeah. to survive and they perceive themselves in a place of difficulty they will abuse others so that they can survive um, yeah, so if you Sorry? You don't think bank bonuses are an abuse? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm, I'm not talking about um, the people who have enough money. I'm talking no, about no, with those no, people, yeah, the people with not enough money and so may need to go to other sources um, to get money. I I, yeah, yeah, so if you get people above the OK line, I think there will be naturally... I, I think morals are quite natural. I think I believe that people are good in nature if they have certain things fulfilled, as it were. So I think families would be happier if the mom isn't working um, two time two part time jobs and isn't there for their kids. If she's less stressed, she will be a better mother, and the family as a whole will be happier. And, and that will have small impacts across the community, their neighbours, and it just, yeah. Brings back social morality. But then do yeah. you not need the underclass to keep that debt rolling? Like, is that, the, is that not in? <laughs> it's basically it, really, isn't it? But, oh, yeah, that's a, in an ideal world, that's what we need. Did the uh, Greeks have interest? Yes, uh, they did. Um, it was originally thought of as a kind of gift and appreciation of being allowed to use somebody's wheat or, or some commodity or other. But they, um, they did have it. They found it quite difficult to conceptualise 
they called it tokos, which means offspring or birth. And they still call it tokos, the Greeks. Um, and this led to, because that, that, that's actually a good example of reducing a cultural phenomenon to a natural phenomenon. How this mysterious thing that's going on where you, you don't do anything. You, you just have this money and you, you just sort of hand it somebody and then it, it grows. I mean, for us, that's what happens all the time. But for the Greeks, this was really odd. And I am at the moment working on a lecture which I interpret the Oedipus in this way, but I won't go into that. Um, <laughs> Oedipus Economicus. I, we've, had the <laughs> we've had the Freudian Oedipus. I mean, it's actually quite interesting. Because Aristotle is a key figure here. Because Aristotle said there's a, there's a good form of commerce and a bad form of commerce, and the bad form of commerce is unnatural. And the good call, form of commerce is what's called CMC, you have a commodity and you might exchange it to money in order to get another commodity because that's convenient. Money is a convenient way of ensuring that you get commodities you don't have. Then there's a bad form of commerce, which is called MCM, in which you have money. You buy a commodity in order to sell it to get more money. So the whole point of the thing is getting money. And, and Aristotle was horrified by that. He says it's unnatural. And Aristotle's um, teaching was a basis of, of Catholic teaching on the economy. It still is, actually, but of course it's not it's totally inconsistent with the whole of our economy. And, uh, but even worse for Aristotle is lending money at interest. He says that's unnatural, and it's called tokos, because nothing happens, that this thing just grows in this grotesque way. Now, unnatural offspring you know, is, is, is incestuous. You, marriage is an is a economic relationship in the ancient world. Marry your mother is like, um, that kind of incest is like monetary interest because you're not creating any external relation as you should. It's, it's interest is incestuous. Mm -hmm. So this is my idea about Oedipus. But the answer to your basic, there's a whole argument, the answer to your basic question is, is yes. Yeah. Though it's relatively simple compared to derivatives and yes, all yes, this huge yeah. panoply of, of Charlatanism that we have now. Yeah. Thank you. Mm. Very interesting. Um, two quite different questions. You said you thought the policy money thing was the least revolutionary idea you'd ever met. <laughs> I'd love you to propose a more revolutionary one. The other thing is quite different. Is what were the ancient Indians doing while the Greeks were getting on with what they were getting on with? Oh, well, yeah, I mean, I could go on for a few hours on that <laughs> second one, but I won't. As for the first one, yes, I'm, I'm tongue-in-cheek. I mean, in fact, of course, it is a radical proposal, but it won't appear to be one, because all it appears to do is to create what people think happens already. So it's just a matter of appearances. As for India, uh, what I said was that the changes that occurred intellectually in, in particular, Greece, India, and China, about 600 BC, are what we're still living with. Uh, they created the, the modern world, in a sense. I mean, in modern science, it's simply a continuation of the principles which were established in these Greek, three great cultures at about the same time. It's sometimes called the axial age. Mm -hmm. And as a lot of mentioned, I'm going to a conference on it shortly um, in Krakow, giving a paper. But um, my, some of my research recently has been, again, taxpayer funded, thank you, um, it's, com it's about the actual age. It's comparing early Greek thought with early Indian thought, mm -hmm. which is very strikingly similar uh, in all sorts of interesting ways. And what I'm doing is saying, ah, if you look at these three societies, India, China, and Greece, and say, what else do they have in common, apart from creating this wholly new conception of the world, which is our conception of the world, basically, what they had in common is monetization. They were each of them independently monetized. There's no other society of which that was true. Monetization has occurred independently in three places, Greece, India, and China. And the philosophy has occurred independently as well. So there's a connection between the monetization and the intellectual transformation. Um, so that's a big project that I'm working on at the moment. 
And excuse me, is there a link also between the, what we call the religious and religious spiritual traditions, which were, were the, were the Buddha was about yes. that time, wasn't he? And then yes. was it um, Confucius or no? Yes, um, yes. Yeah. Confucius and... Absolutely, the Buddha. I mean, for yeah. example, the Buddha is generally nowadays regarded as being born about 480 BC, mm. precisely at the time when India is being monetized you know, from archaeology and so on. And uh, you suddenly, for example, here's an example. Let's see what you make of this. So I couldn't, wouldn't be able to persuade many of my academic colleagues. Um, in the earliest Indian texts, there's nothing like karma, K-A-R-M-A, which um, we all know roughly what karma means. It's, people in the West know what it means, but it was, it's everywhere is karma. But um, people talk about good karma and bad karma. And it, it didn't exist until about the 5th, 4th century BC with early Buddhism. Now, karma is a metaphysical substance which you store up through your actions and which you then can affect your future well-being, and which is individually owned and can be individually inherited. Does that remind you of anything? <laughs> <laughs> and and what, they, what the scholar, some scholars have noticed that karma is, is like currency. There's a man called Richard Gombrich, who's, who's an eminent Sanskrit scholar. It's like a currency. It's, like a, it's, it, it, it's created on the analogy of currency. Um, it, in order to describe it, people use metaphor. They use the metaphor of currency. I mean, not everybody says that. One or two people say that. And you think, well, that's not quite right, because if you say a lion, uh, this warrior is a lion, that's a metaphor, because you know what a warrior is like, you know what a lion is like, you're comparing two names. If you say mm, um, currency, money, is a metaphor for karma, it's quite different, because you don't know what karma is. It's not a money is a metaphor for karma. Karma is constructed out of money. And one of the pieces of evidence about this is that karma comes into being as an idea exactly the same time as money does. Money is all powerful. It is individually owned. It affects the well-being of people. It involves, it drives circulation. Karma does that. It des describe, drives the cosmic cycle and so on and so forth. It's abstract and concrete at the same time. So it means obvious that karma is a metaphysical projection of, of money. I have no idea what, what else it could conceivably be. I'm sorry, I'm going to shoot across that one. I'm sure that's, I think that's fantastic and very clever. But in the Dhammapada, You'll know more about the dates of these things than I do. I think it's Pali, not Sanskrit, isn't it, the Dhamma Yes, yes. Well, and I yes. think it's about the 4th century BC. Well, these things are impossible to date. The Indian texts are impossible to date. But it may well be that some of the earliest Buddhist texts, uh, the Pali ones, are as early as that. So Most people think they're later, but it's possible that they're okay. it, ha it, it has what I understand to be a really lovely um, interpretation of karma. Um, this is the, I'm not meaning to discredit yours because I think it's a great analogy, but it simply says something like um, our being of today was created by our thoughts of yesterday and our being of tomorrow, will be, our life of tomorrow will be created by our thoughts of today. That's the opening of the Dharma Karta. Yes. Which is, to me is a fantastic explanation I, yes, of karma. It is fantastic. That sort of thing is fantastic. But we could also use it to mean energy. Well, I understand well, that and therefore money is energy and but there's lots of stuff like that, which is terrific. And there are other processes which go into the construction of karma, like agriculture, which is obviously a basic economic activity. So karma is often imagined as the fruit of. Yeah. So it's not only money. I'm just saying money is an important factor in it. But that thought, what I'm saying to you, is that that thought comes out of a, 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 out of a, a conceptual structure which is only possible because of monetization. It doesn't mean that every statement of karma can be reduced to a statement about money. But the idea of your actions and your thoughts of today producing some substance in the future is inconceivable in a pre-monetary society because it doesn't happen. So, 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 sorry, sorry. Philosoph <laughs> philosophical <laughs> idealism would, would, would not, could not have occurred in a pre-monetary society. Correct. 
Okay, well, I'm skeptical of that, but fine. <laughs> Give me an example. <laughs> oh, I'm not. I'm really, yeah, well, I can't, I can't, I can't do that. I'm just, I'm just skeptical. But it could still be the other way around, Richard. It could still be the other what, way around. What do you mean by the other way around? I just mean that the zeitgeist of the time, um, which could have been captured in the early Buddhist thinking, could also then lead to a materialisation of that through the money. Yes. System. Yes, indeed. Um, yes, yes, if you. The point is often put to me, particularly about the Greeks, how do you know that it was money that created abstract thought rather than the other way around? Yeah. Yeah. And I, my, the answer I have to that is, I can give an account, I have given an account in detail, of how money came into being as a historical process, certain geographical, social, religious, political factors. Several chapters in my book about how it happened. It may not be right, but it's, it's a perfectly reasonable account, and maybe other accounts. Not a problem. How did abstract thought of this? How, how did the idea that what is most real is most abstract and nothing else is really real? How did that happen? How did that come into the world? It's so completely counterintuitive. Cave art? Cave It's not necessarily no, no. counterintuitive. It seems counterintuitive to us. It might not seem All right, leave aside the counterintuitive. Cave art's got nothing to do with it. These, <laughs> these, these people. Cave art is. Cave art is these beautiful pictures of... Uh, uh, I think it's much more than that. I think it's embodying ideas in image form. Well, the fact that you don't have language in cave art, what you have language in the Rig Veda, the early pre-monetary texts, the language in Homer, lots of it, lots of pre-monetary texts, there is never remotely anything like the idea, which is a pretty odd idea, but it was dominant in monetary ancient society, that the most real thing in the world is abstract. It's an abstract entity. There is no abstract entity in cave art, or indeed in the Homer, or in the Rig Veda, or in any pre text. That they story do not is, exist. I'm suggesting that storytelling is an abstract. It's, it's an embodiment of abstract well, ideas. Well, and that goes back yes. a long way before money. Well, of course, and storytelling is a basic human activity. But I'm using abstract in a very specific sense. I'm using abstract in the way that, say, Plato uses the idea and the way that early Buddhists did and the Upanishads use it when they talk about Brahman and Atman and so on. What they mean is it cannot be perceived by the senses. Yes. Right? That's what, I mean, I, to be sure, you're right, the word abstract can be used in all sorts of different ways. What it means from the Latin abstraho, which means drawing out. Yes. You're taking X out of Y and treating it as separate from Y. That's a very basic human activity. And what Plato and others do is to take the non-corporeal out from the corporeal and imagine it in separation from what can be perceived by the senses. So for Plato, what is real? It's not perceived by the senses at all, it's perceived by the mind. If you can perceive it by the senses, it's inferior, has less reality, less important, and so on and so forth. So you're talking now, about the function of intuition, which do, I would argue does come into cave. No, I'm not, I'm not talking about intuition. I'm not talking about intuition. I'm talking about the belief that there is this thing which is abstract, this entity, which if you're a clever philosopher, you can train yourself to have access to. It's all described beautifully in Plato. You move up from beautiful corporeal things, but you leave them behind, and you realise that the real thing, the most beautiful thing, is not perceived by the senses at all, it's perceived by the mind. Nothing to do with intuition, and nothing to do with narrative. It is, I mean... It's pretty odd. <laughs> well, but but uh, uh, it depends on one's experience, which is not odd at all. All right, maybe it's not odd. I agree, and I also think that the intuition, the mystical experience, the transcendent experience, touches that same realm. Well, um, what I would say is that money is, a, and indeed abstract ontology, as I call it, is a recent human invention. It occurs only from the 6th century BC, and it happens together. These two things happen together. And... Before that time, human beings have lived for tens of thousands of years. So it's like most of our um, inventions that we think are somehow natural, like writing and money and class society and so on, even agriculture. They're relatively recent in human history. And therefore, going into Plato's abstract ontology, and whether you call it odd or not, it is quite different from everything that proceeds. From cave painting narratives or not, it is completely different. And nevertheless, clearly, human beings 
before money and before Plato, have the capacity, they must have done, given certain external changes in the economy, to envisage what Plato envisages. And you're right, there is a mystic element to it. But there is nothing before Plato remotely like what I call abstract ontology. And there's nothing in any pre monetarist society remotely like what I call abstract ontology, despite the very large numbers of texts. And that, that to me, is a significant fact. Anybody else got any questions they'd like to, to raise? Saw the meaning behind what was said. It wasn't spelt out, but it was all told as tales or, or metaphorically. That's what I feel. <laughs> and if you have the uh, if you had the insight, the uh, the contemplative power, you would recognise the hint of hidden meanings. For other people, they were surface stories. <laughs> what did the owl represent on the Greek coins? Ah, yes. They were called the coins were actually it is associated with the the coins were called popularly owl. Um, in a sort of affectionate way, give me a couple of owls, because they had the owl on them, and that le those letters are A T H E for Athens or Athena, and um, in Homer, <coughs> Athena is called Glaucopis Athena, lovely phrase meaning owl-eyed Athena, and um, so the owl became a symbol of Athena, and that's why it's on the coin. It obviously looks good. Other Greek cities had other animals, um, like dolphins and lions and tortoises and, and so on, and birds. And she was and of wisdom, yes, I mean, she, there's, the question is, yes, I mean, the question is specifically about the owl. Yes. But the Athena is not just, she's got as wisdom, but she's also the patroness of the city of Athens, mm -hmm. and figures in dramas, and is a much loved in whom you have confidence, just as you should have confidence in the coins on which she did. It's funny that she's the, um, she's the goddess of wisdom, but if you talk about democracy in Athens, women were never allowed to have their say. If they're so wise, yes. it's quite funny, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it's very interesting, of course. In, in, in the sphere of the politics and the economy, you repress women, who, and the female principle then has to, as it were, come up and dominate huge areas of religious activity. So in the symbolic sphere, the females are probably more important than the males. In every other sphere, the males are depressing the females. <laughs> Thank you, Richard, for a splendid... That's great. So see you all in the last day. If, every, if anybody wants to watch this again, it will be put on the Facebook page. Uh, <laughs> so it should be recorded and it should be good audio quality this time. And <laughs> <laughs> you put the slides on as well? We will. It, we have I will do my best to keep the noise at a manageable sound and rather than noise. Great.